Greetings, everyone. This is Ayman Tarabishi. I'm the ICSB Executive Director of the International Council for Small Business. I am also the Deputy Chair of uh, the Department of Management at the GW School of Business um, in Washington, D.C. I am um, just delighted to have all of you here. I recognize names here, and I can know that there are people from Nigeria, from Egypt, from Italy here, from the U.S., so we are global as usual here with ICSB, so I'm just excited about that. Today is Thursday, and I, I have to say, you know, sometimes when, when, you, when you come up with a crazy idea and then you actually see it happen, and, and, and it actually does happen, and then you, you say to yourself, wow, you know, who would ever know that this is, and Canada as well, that, uh, that ever happens here. So let me tell you why I am excited, right? And I'll tell you why, and Belgium too, so everybody is jumping in, why I'm excited here. And, and then I want to see this in the chat here, right? So we, we can build it up here, okay? So Norris, you're, you're, my, you're my partner in crime here. So how, to, how many of you watch, what is your favorite movie of all time? Right in the chat, what is your favorite movie of all time? Let's just write this down. Tell us what's your favorite movie of all time. Titanic, okay? So Christina right away. Are you serious, Gremlins, Giovanna? <laughs> I like gremlins, but okay, right? Casablanca. Blanca. All right, Norris, right? Meet Joe Black. Ooh, that's a nice one. All right, Fargo, right? The Matrix. Oh, by the way, they're doing Matrix number four now. He's coming back. Matrix four is coming back. And Driving Miss Daisy, The Titanic, Top Gun. Okay, there's a sequel coming up. The Glass Castle, yep. Pursuit of Happiness. That's a good one with Will Smith. Um, all right, so I haven't seen Godfather. I haven't seen Mio Dio, Antonella, Madovese con Godfather. Why did no one ever mention the Godfather, right? So you're, how, wasn't Godfather great, right? Wasn't the Godfather great? Now, the only, what I understand, the only sequel ever to stand as good as the first one is what? Godfather Part Two. Do you remember? Right, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro, right? Godfather one and Godfather part two is good as well, right? So, so here's the idea. So I want you just to be in that frame of mind, okay? Um, Godfather one, Godfather two, right? The sequel here. So imagine your favorite movie and imagine your favorite, you know, that you ever watched that. And then 25 years later, right? and the sequel comes out, right? There was a, this question mark still remaining, right? The, or, or something that wasn't really complete till the end, like Casablanca. What happened till the end? Do we ever know what really happened at the end type of thing? Or Gone with the Wind type of thing, you know? So I'm in Gone with the Wind. So I imagine that mindset. Are you following me with the mindset now? Do you see how this is, how I'm positioning this, right? Right, you, you, see, you, see, you see how this is all being positioned? Now, knowing this very well and, and trying to get or message in a bottle, trying to get this. Now imagine this, that we always experience this, but then you know of a paper that was published 25 years ago, okay? And it was a huge, huge, tremendous, had tremendous impact on research, on, on how we do research, on the academic field, on, on, on our conversation, on everything, right? And you know that this is that this one was was one of the big heavyweight articles. You know when people say this is the most downloaded article of all time, and 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 so on and so on. And you see this, and then you go to these conferences, and then you go to to these events, and you see this person walking in front of you that just passed you by is the author of this article, right? You. So I always wanted to know. I mean, like, where did this article come from? What was the inspiration of it? What was the inspiration, the idea behind it? How did you put it together? What was the ideology behind it? What were you thinking for God's sake when you wrote this article type of thing? And so I had all these questions, right? And then on top of all of this, then I wanted to know, so what happened? What's next? What's the outcome of this, right? And this is exactly what happened. This was as crazy idea as it happened. So I met Norris and I met him a lot of times. But a couple of years ago, I, I met him in 2018 and we were at an event or in a conference and I was like, Norris, I have this idea. And Norris goes, yes, I mean, what's your idea? What do you want to do? I said, do you remember your article? He goes, oh yeah. I'm like, you know, it's been 25 years. He goes, oh wow, time flies. I'm like, 
What about a refresh? What about if you write it again for us in, 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 in our new journal, in our ICSB new journal? And, and he goes, well, I'm busy, I'm doing this, but let me think about it and I'll, I'll come back for it. Um, and I said to him, I said, okay. And he did, he did come back. He goes, okay, I'm, in, I'm convinced, I'll write it. And that's what we did. That's what he did really, right? He wrote the article again, Entrepreneurial Potential and Potential Entrepreneurs 25 Years On. So he did it and we published it. And I said, well, that's the end of it. You know, we published it. There was no such thing as Zoom meetings or webinars or maybe put you in a conference, you can talk about it and that's it. And then every, all this craziness happens. And of course I call Norris, I'm like, Norris, we need to do this webinar. We need to bring you back here. We need to talk about this because this is an unfinished story. This is an unfinished business here. And so he gladly agreed and I'm so grateful for him. So now you know the context of all of this. Now you understand how this all evolved. So saying this, I wanna give you a big heartfelt thank you, Norris, for, for, for believing in all of this craziness here. And, and for you to kind of talk to us through what happened in the beginning and where we are today and where's the future. So, and then I'll get to ask you questions, but then I'll open it up for everybody else. So, so let's give Norris a big round of applause because this really makes my day. <laughs> you have, I'm like a kid in a candy store with this. This is just amazing. So the floor is yours, Norris. And you, you, you must've had a horrible day. Uh, horrible day. I, I'm <laughs> glad to be here. I'm honored. Uh, is it, I'm and I share the sort of yes and model that when in doubt, go for it. And that's, you know, you've certainly in the success of ICSB that's been, been manifest and they hope uh, for me to some degree. But one of the reasons he, he likes is that the story about this is, this wouldn't have happened, article would probably not have happened and been as successful if there, it hadn't been for a chance encounter at a drum roll. ICSB conference. Uh, there was a special issue that I had most of the idea for, but I had a hole in 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 in, in the narrative. And sitting there and listening, my then soon to be co-author was presenting, and and she her pa her paper was very disjointed, but she had the she had the missing piece, and Mike uh, uh, Mike Scott. Uh, the late great Mike Scott from Sterling stood up, pointed at me, and started yelling, "You two, talk now!" And I went, uh, "Okay." Uh, and the deadline was eight days away for the special issue, so we just got got busy and firing emails back and forth, and we got it in an hour. I got it in an hour before the deadline, and then I opened the mail. Now this is you know long enough ago that people would actually mail stuff. Oh, we have extended the deadline a week. <laughs> so, and now let's not revise it. Uh, and if we had revised it, it might have made it worse. But it's sort of a crazy story. But it resonated with a lot of people. For those of you who are, who are wanting to publish more and more, come up with ideas that are essentially enabling technologies for other people that the joke is, if you want to be hated at your university, win the Nobel Prize. That, it, you know, the Godfather is not about gangsters. Game of Thrones wasn't about some mythical medieval kingdom. It was about academic politics, except not as bloody as, <laughs> as the politics. But you have something that people like my work on intentions, people found it useful, and, and, and that's quite satisfying. When they use it badly, that that's another completely other story. And I'm glad to be here. I see some great names uh, on the list: Amal, Asma, Alexandra, uh, uh, Jackie, Lene, and Saida. Uh, uh, great to see names I know, and it is just as great to see all the names I don't recognize. That was the amazing thing about the the California Educator Entrepreneurship Educator Conference that ICSB powered. I'm looking at the list of people. I'm looking at the people who are asking questions and their names I don't know. Their schools I don't know. And their ideas were just as good as everyone else's. You know, we talk a good game about diversity and inclusion, but one area that academia often fails at is engaging people from 
around the world. I mean, I have no idea what time it is in Macedonia, but Alexandra, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have some, uh, some absolutely amazing gems here. But the, my theme was w, WTD. Uh, I hope I, you know, I'm not too offensive to the religious, but uh, I'm in very uh, interestingly accused me of being the Nikola Tex Tesla of our field. And I, I, I sort of mixed emotions. I have the same, same cheesy mustache. Uh, I am about as, you know, I am about as financially astute as he was, <laughs> he, he was personally, but Tesla would, would bitch and moan and yell about what was things weren't working. And then he'd go try to solve it. And a lot of it, his secret was rethinking his assumptions. And you think about Einstein, you think about Richard Feynman, uh, the great minds of our, of, of, of the past century that think rethinking all of our assumptions, just like we tell entrepreneurs, right? Rethink every critical assumption of your business model. Think through your value chain, your supply chain, your customer value proposition. Now is the time to rethink everything. And I think from the perspective of academe and, and what we're doing, that this is time for the great rethink. And I, I, you know, ICSB has already, you know, I think launched this with this webinar series. So why, if the simple idea is that the macro and the micro are, are, are connected in complex, interesting ways. That the entrepreneurial potential of a community, of an organization, of a neighborhood is a function of the potential entrepreneurs. The quantity of them, the quality of them really matters. And in the more great entrepreneurs and potential entrepreneurs you grow, the local entrepreneur potential goes on. Work by people like Startup Genome uh, are speaking to that and Startup Link. And the others, the, the ones who are getting it right are, are at least implicitly seeing that. I think that's important because uh, it, to me, it's very interesting and it's very illuminating. If I've been to think about entrepreneurship education when I spent two solid days worrying about entrepreneurial ecosystems and vice versa. And I think that it's fun. So let's, let's start on a rethink, great rethink. We're gonna rethink the mindset, rethink Entrepreneurial ecosystems, and we can, might uh, rethink methods. Uh, that that will I think that's a late, longer, later discussion. But I think I wanted to one thing I'm going to close with that I didn't want to put here. I didn't want to frighten I am in is I think we need to re, 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 rethink universities. Anyway, my joke is when in a new audience I'll say, okay, let's. What does an entrepreneur mean? And I'll say, let's start something easy. It's entrepreneur is a noun, right? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah. And I go, no, it's a verb. And apparently in Greece, it is a verb, <laughs> but uh, that it's about action. So let's get busy. That, you know, that if Tesla, if, you know, if I were actually were Tesla, uh, it'd be sort of, let's find the biggest, gnarliest, you know, question that we can actually do something about. One of the things that we, we've learned, and, and I and I have a mutual friend who recently retired as chief economist at the SBA, Giuseppe Garmina, and the SBA studied, they keep finding that who leads the economy out of the doldrums? How do they lead them out of darkness? And it's always the SMEs. It's the new businesses. It's the small businesses that have figured out how to innovate. And oh, by the way, have, have done their own great, great rethink about their, their businesses. It, it really matters that they are the ones, the difference makers. We want to come out of this recession roaring. There, there are folks. On the other hand, there is some, there are researchers and scholars who argue that no, 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 it's not about the entrepreneurs. It's about the institutions and it's about unicorns. Uh, I actually read something earlier this week that actually really aggravated me saying we should cut all support to small business. We should only focus on companies that venture capitalists support. And there is some data that might that kind of suggest that. But it's the lens you look at. You need to step back. You know, all this, the turmoil in, in my country about uh, that 
you have to look through the world through a very different lens, not the lens you've been used to. If you're looking through that institutional lens, you're going to miss a lot. Is, and I'm looking through a lens, you know, as a middle-aged, middle-class, straight white guy, I have to be very mindful of the lens, the lenses that I look for. So groups like uh, ICSB, Academy Management, I get exposed to a lot of different perspectives. Uh, and it really forces you to, instead of trying to make sense out of it from our own lens, is it looking through new lenses, demand, break, sense breaking, sense demanding in, in the cognitive literature. That this whole notion is entrepreneurial activity intentional or does it emerge from enabling conditions that the institutions create is a debate I, I would love to see, you know, let's take off the gloves and let's duke it out, uh, you know, in, in perhaps a, a webinar. That one of the things that I would say, I mean, so I should mention research ideas, but one of the things I've noticed in he healthy happening ecosystems that a lot of the entrepreneurial events are being put on, but not by the power players, but by the women's business center or the minority business center or the veterans entrepreneurs. I wonder if we could sort of count and see how many of these, the higher the percentage, i to get this right, the higher the percentage of these events in, in a community, the more they're going to do. Uh, but I think that's sort of exciting. There are a couple other research things with research uh, sort of on our side of the table, perhaps. Uh, Victor Wong, who uh, until recently was head of entrepreneurship at, at Kauffman, Human Marion Common Foundation has been part of a very large coalition, 100 plus entities uh, called Start Us Up Now to create what they call the Amer America's New Business Plan. But it's really not American. It just looks, looks good on print. That it's uh, policy prescriptives that are based on theory and have evidence to support them. I would disagree with some of them, but nonetheless, theory based, evidence based, without any real partisan. A political bias to it. And there are a lot of research around it. Are these things going to happen? Uh, what, it, what happens when they do? Even the, the, the trajectory of this, given this is a US uh, election year. Uh, Victor has taken it further. There's right to start uh, org. That is a bit more of a, of a polemic, but some interesting stuff. And I thought you should see this. Uh, and one thing that I, I want to mention my one of my by my own biases my own lens is that entrepreneurship research is not an armchair sport that you if you're not out there talking to entrepreneurs talking to entrepreneurship students uh you're going to miss a lot of of the important questions and the best economists who look like armchair are armchair ac academics have that in their background they they actually do get that so what are the opportunities for rethinking the mindset uh, several years ago, I uh, actually now nearly a decade ago, I sort of fell into neuroscience. This stuff is hard. It hurts. Uh, I'm pretty smart and it hurts my brain. But in the last few years, we have uncovered so much about human, how humans learn. And we are in a field where virtually no articles that research the impact of our education have any good theory at all. The embarrassing part is the number one model we use are intentions. So I get citations, that's great. Uh, but I'm not sure that that's, you know, that as far from an ideal theoretical framework. But it's also an opportunity. How do we, because our, our colleagues do not know the theory and they don't know the practice, how many business school professors have had uh, teacher training? I went through professional teacher training, so it, and it blew my mind at how much we yeah, I didn't know about about education. I have teaching awards, and the reason I have them is by accident I was doing the right things, purely by accident. So there's some real opportunity in terms on the practice side that there are things where anybody on this call could get involved and 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 start helping with this because what's coming uh for those of you who are familiar with the dutch their bko i cannot pronounce it let alone spell it uh but it's a everybody who's going to be an educator at a university will take 200 to 250 hours 
of rigorous training on the theory and practice of education. And the accrediting bodies are very well aware of it. The AACSB is looking rather fondly at that. They can't say that, but they are. The other thing that we're, we're going to start seeing more and more of is, okay, tell us how, what the impact of your, of your programs are. That AECSB has already told, actually told the, uh, told the USASB meeting and an Academy Management Entrepreneurship Division meeting that you guys are idiots for not assessing impact because you actually will get positive results. But we're now that we're getting tools to, to, to work on that, I think that's something and for you personally and for your, your institution to take a leap forward to differentiate yourself in a very positive way is educator training and this. Uh, so I'm going to, I've already told Iman that <clears throat> future webinar, we ought to talk about the EPIC assessment tool that came out of the EU that I helped with. And there were some bloody marvelous people involved in that, Andy Penaluna, Tara Moberg and, and more. Renegades, uh, they're still arguing whether we're the renegades or the rebels, but it's going to be a, a MOOC about teaching tools. And I want to definitely keep you posted on that. Uh, Don Winkle, uh, Andy, uh, Carl Jones, and, and it's like got eight of the 10 best thinkers and doers in entrepreneurship education uh, all in the same MOOC plus me. Uh, I'm pretty excited. And I think there might be at some point, you know, an opportunity, a very participatory opportunity for theories because I know there'll be a quiz on this later. I have no idea if you can even read this text, but this is just a subset of the learning theories and models that are out there. And virtually none of these have been looked at in the entrepreneurial setting. So one thing any of you could do is say, oh, I really like Vygotsky or I really like Montessori I'm going to, I'm going to apply that. I'm going to write an article, maybe do a conceptual paper, then do a, an, an empirical study. <clears throat> it would jump the field forward immensely. <clears throat> you would leave the rest of the business school certainly in, in, in the dust. And I'm thinking the value you, you can have because, you know, when I, I read article, well, there's one, it was all about Vygotsky. It's a great model. Uh, interesting to apply. And the guy misspelled Vygotsky through the whole thing. The editors and reviewers didn't catch it. So there's a little caveat, editors and reviewers, don't, even at AMLE, don't, don't always get this. <clears throat> I want to plug Epic just because I was involved in it and shameless self-promotion is, is part of our field. I want to promote my, my colleagues on that and understanding assessment. Happy to come back and, and, and talk more about this uh, if you're interested. Um, what are the opportunities from rethinking ecosystems? We all say bottom up, entrepreneur led, like Brad Felt said. And I run into scholars. I was at a high level meeting of entrepreneurship scholars, and half of them didn't know who Techstars was. Most of them didn't know who Brad Felt was. If you're doing ecosystems, this, this is an important, important stuff. And a lot of them actually believe in the top down model, and they can't figure out why it, at home it doesn't actually work. Well, because the top down triple helix model it doesn't actually work. Uh, but it looks good and makes institutions happy. But we have no measure of bottom upness, if that's a word. Maybe we need supervenient is the fancy philosophical term, but I'm not sure that works either. But uh, how do we assess that? That is a huge research opportunity to, to look at. Um, I think uh, maybe a more narrow example look at tech transfer at universities. Why is it so bad? And it seems intentionally bad in many ways for seemingly good reasons, perhaps. But what if you applied an open innovation model to that? There's people are starting to talk about that. That's a huge, huge uh, research area. <clears throat> the uh, Techna is the Technology Councils of North America, that's state level uh, innovation councils and tech councils and science and tech. And they are, considered by you know, the people in their local communities consider them basically useless. Uh, that, why is that? And what could be better? Another topic. Uh, near and dear to my heart is, <clears throat> we talked about this in a prior event, was how <clears throat> there is a very large <clears throat> initiative 
<clears throat> that was launched by the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation and set free on the world called eShip. It's about making ecosystem building, ecosystem builders uh, into a powerful force for good. As opposed to the top-down model, this is very explicitly focusing on bottom-up listening to the entrepreneurs. <clears throat> I'm one of the gold, 12 gold champions of the seven overarching goals. Uh, happy to, to, to share that, but uh, at more length. Uh, but there is a, a wish list. I'm in challenges. You know, basically, it was like, call me up and said, I want a wish list. What can we do to help? What can ICSB do? What, what are the projects that we could immediately get busy on? And I said, <clears throat> game on. Uh, uh, some of the projects that are more farther along than others is one, it's a very solid, flexible uh, re uh, research focus on, on building, surveying the ecosystem builder nation, Egypt nation, about surveying what they're thinking, what they want, but also doing surveys for them. I don't know if this ends up being like the NFIB monthly uh, poll taking uh, a survey, whether it's like uh, the crazy stuff McKinsey does, is it going to be like a version of GEM, you know, the global ecosystem monitor? GEM is already working on that at the national level. Uh, is this a panel study of ecosystem dynamics? Uh, we don't, but that's, that's part of the initial question. But if you're interested in this sort of thing, this uh, it wouldn't take that much money that much uh it, it takes some brain power how do we do it do that right and, and there are a couple of important questions that have come out of eship that the, the large numbers of people in eship the ecosystem builders on the ground really want to want to know and again can go back and talk more about that there's also a great initiative that went completely rogue out of eship on storytelling and building a hub where we can share the great narratives. We're gonna, it's not enough to have data. We need to have change the narrative that this is our time. This is the entrepreneur's time. And one part of that is the unsung heroes initiative where they're showcasing people even I've never heard of and going, wow, what are they accomplishing in their communities? Just like, whoa, I'm sorry. You know, it's the matrix. It's not, I guess that's the Bill and Ted uh, Siegel. Whoa, uh, I'm just not John. I'm, I'm, I've been accused of looking like John Wick, but I'm afraid I don't have quite the the, the same skills. But I think there's a real opportunity. You know, the low hang. <clears throat> these are the low hanging fruit there because we could all be generating great new new finding the stories. These unsung heroes from around the world, and it wouldn't be hard to, to figure out either how to. Uh, spend some money to institutionalize and, and you know, put some some real meat on on the existing mechanism, or to sort of almost the franchise model of getting people to be doing unsung heroes in their part of the world. That again, web, some webinars. There are some interesting research issues uh, just coming out about gov the governance of ecosystem. How do you keep the bullies from bullying? Kind of thing. And the micro foundations, this really speaks to me as this, you know, in terms of entrepreneurial potential, what are the, 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 the psychological and social and cultural micro foundations of healthy or less healthy ecosystems? And three or four of these, uh, we could do webinars on some of these projects. If we've got some traction, let's drill down and come away after an hour with serious action plans. Uh, my favorite is, you know, the depth SEM. But uh, that, 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 of all the things I've said, that's the one thing that get me killed. People cannot give up their structural equation modeling, even when it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but I, a couple of things I point out. One thing we, the economists make fun of us is that we do these additive models when we really should be doing multiplicative models. It's a little tricky, but I think you know, that's a very publishable area. And there's a whole graph databases is becoming huge in industry. It's like, it's not, instead of a normal database, it's, it, it has directionality, that there are nodes and connections with, with directions. It's computationally powerful, and it, it elicits relationships that you would never find otherwise. 
and here's the scary one for a lot of people. Uh, I keep meeting young people who are saying, I don't need to take a class at University of Idaho or Boise State. I, why would I take a class from them when I can take a class, let's say a class in creativity, and I just go and take Tina Seelig's class at Stanford. That if I'm going to do design thinking, I'm going to go to Jeannie Ledka at, at Virginia and on and on. That what if this world of Zoom keeps going? People are figuring out, why would I take a local course when I could take someone from one of the five or 10 best people in the world who are not only experts in the field, but they're great educators. This is like that old, uh, you know, great courses thing that they used to do by videotape. And now, it, now it's online. They're doing well. So who would, you know, what it could turn universities into professors are no longer doing their own lectures. They're curating information uh, they're curating the resources to share with uh, with their learners that's a very different world and that has its upside more time for research more time to engage the community theoretically maybe more time with your family but that world is changing and i suspect there might be a very real first mover advantage <clears throat> what if icsb said we're going to find the best five or ten court you know whatever the entrepreneurship or small business topic who are the best people out there and draw from all over the world because in the zoom world we can be very asynchronous uh, is that could be very exciting and there certainly is coming up with a way to certify that is you know if you know you got an a online with uh, tina seelig's course at stanford and your university won't accept the credits so it's tough that some sort of badging or certification but i think there's a chance to really rethink not just you know how universities are are likely to change but how we and our friends and colleagues can can benefit from that and that curating role i think uh it's going to be very different but we're at, we're in an industry our a group of a scholarly group of in entrepreneurship and small business we are already really good at this oh wow jeff stamp has another video out i gotta you know send it out or Oh my God, Jill Kickle has got this new thing, and Sophie did this thing on social. It's just uh, uh, staggering. We're already seeing it in some of these certificate programs. Anyway, shameless self promotion. And the question I always ask, because even though I always get an answer I don't want, is what have I missed? What have I got wrong? Uh, those are particularly painful, but I need to I need to to hear that. So. Let's see what else. Oh, the magic. So, what have I missed? And I'm I've not been able to. I've had a little trouble pulling up the the chat here. Oh, and as soon as I say that, the chat appears. Anyway, Nigel Adams in the house, University of Buckinghamshire in uh, southwestern England. The guy has the, one of the most amazing entrepreneurship programs you'll ever see. Uh, and he keeps saying, well, I'm just an old business guy and I'm just doing what makes sense and what work, seems to work. And it's like he's channeling a neuroscientist. He's just saying, how is it that he get, does all these things without, uh, without even trying? But, but uh, Nigel, glad to have you. Let's see. Saida, yes, we will definitely I, well, the, everything will be available. I'm, I'm excited. Let's see. Yes, there are people saying I already inspired ideas for papers for Paris 2021. Be sure to mention, you know, when you submit it that you were on this webinar. <laughs> I don't know if that will. All right, Norris. That will help. Norris, I'm stepping in now. Okay. Okay. My go ahead. Turn. My Your turn. turn Okay, so and then we're going to open up for for questions and answers. Let me let me just ask you some questions here, and I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take any shortcuts here. I'm gonna go right straight to the point here. Okay, there's a lot of in the last couple of years there's a lot of interest in different topics that have popped up. Let me give you just a whole slew of them here, right? So we, we're talking about you know the business model canvas, and we're talking about social entrepreneurship or CSV. Heck, ICSB has humane entrepreneurship. Uh, then you have ecosystems. Then you have 
you know, effectualization, then you have a bricolage, then you have, I, I can go on and on and on and on, okay? And, and it seems, oh, and then there's design thinking, which I think is a nice word for empathetic management. Um, and, then, and then we can go through all this. And every time, once in a while, every time everybody gets super excited about one of these words and buzzwords. But fundamentally, at its heart, at its core here, right? It's about a simple concept, right? It's, we can go take it down as to a simple concept about someone thinking about an idea or an entrepreneurial thought and how they take it from point A to point B and, and the ramifications of this. It's the, it's the process, you know what I mean? So you, you've been through this for 25 years, for God's sake, you've, you've seen it all. You probably know, you can say, I'm, and this is coming back again. Every five years, something comes back again that was talked about five years before this. Where are we, to be honest with you? And is it, is it just going to be another continuous cycle now of all of this? You know, we, you know, oh, the most recent one is, I'll give you the most recent one that I'm very happy with and, 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 and excited about, frugal innovation, mm. right? This is going to be now, this is going to be a really exciting frugal innovation, okay? So where are we? Well, as someone who, I need to be frugal, innovate <laughs> frugally, I don't have vast resources, uh, that a lot of these topics have, that frugal innovation is not, particularly new, that it seems to pop up when there are tough economic or uh, disruptive times, that it, it's all about if you're going to get your idea from A, you know, A to Z, you're, you've got to reach out and put your ideas you know, in, in play and test them, uh, whether it, you know, that design thinking is, does better on empathy and how do you really get into the, the shoes of the brains and heart souls of, of your customers? And I always thought if empathy is so critical, why are the least empathetic people on earth, college professors seem to be teaching it? In fact, many of the people teaching design thinking have no idea about entrepreneurship or innovation. They just think it's cool and sexy and they got their dean to approve them teaching his class. Uh, I, I think in a lot of cases is there are there's low hanging fruit and whatever the whatever the labels are that you get a lot of mediocre work not terrible just okay and because it's relatively new it gets accepted for journals and we have this publisher parish uh, intense pressure on 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 so many of you that it's hard to sit back and I'm going to do, I want to write an article that someday will have 5,000 citations. No, I just want to get something published so I can get promoted or not get fired. You know, we're put in a terrible mind and, and I think finding a way to, you know, explore these in, in, in greater depth, whatever they, whatever they are, but it is all about experimentation. It is about uh, the, 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 the intelligent testing of your ideas, just like if, if I'm in a scientific laboratory, that's exactly what you, you run experiments hoping to be proven wrong so you can learn and move forward. And taking those same scientists and getting them to do that with their business ideas, oddly a, a challenge. But I think there are a lot of these ideas and buzzwords and it's nice to, you know, to have things that are, are sexy, that engage our stakeholders, not just you know, our students, our administrators, our people in the community. But doing a rigorous thought, I, I met uh, the late great uh, Bill Guth at NYU. He was, he didn't invent SWAT, but he was one of the great champions in the 1970s of, of SWAT until he did research on it, found out it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> of course, that means a whole bunch of new, new publications, right? And a lot more exec ed uh, dollars uh, that is figuring out what are what's old wine in new bottles is some of these, but I think is really, you know, from my perspective is is you know, I come back to the the neuroscience side of it is we are talking about changing how people think at a very deep level. We are changing and we are also changing their skills. We're changing things, but ultimately that. We're getting to see an industry, a market, 
very differently than, than we did before. And the same is, how do we change the thinking of our, you know, our research should be changing how our colleagues think at a very deep level. I mean, we're not going to come up with, hey, quantum mechanics or uh, something like that. But, you know, but maybe we can. How do we change fundamentally? What is it? What makes, you know, an entrepreneur tick successfully is something we're still, you know, you know maybe we need to, you know, make the, the, the target bigger. And I think there's there is an example from from science. How many of you know what the word uh, phlogiston is? I'll put this in the. Oops, I'm trying to put this into the into the yeah. chat here. But it was this wonderful theory. They said, okay, if you burn something, burn a piece of wood, but you capture all the ashes and the gases, it weighs more. So you subtract something and the weight goes up. So phlogiston was a perfect model that phlogiston had negative weight. But the numbers all worked, it kind of played out. Then somebody writes, hey, it's oxygen. You burn something, it oxidizes, it get, gets bigger. Oh, and there was like overnight a complete, a, a complete shift. What are the phlogistons of, of, you know, what are the theories where we, it looks like it works, but actually we got it backwards. And that would, it would move us forward. And it's something that I, I meant to sort of be random about before is, in 1900, the smartest guy in the world, David Hilbert, a German mathematician, smartest guy in the world, got all his math buddies together and said, hey, hey, is math getting growing as a field or is it just getting bigger? And we could say the same thing. Is entrepreneurship is getting bigger, but is it really growing? And so what Hilbert and his friends genius was, they said, what are the, the 20 some mathematical questions that we need to solve to move the field Forward. What are the big, hairy, important, impossible questions? Um, they came up with 26 of them. Uh, eight of them were actually insoluble. Of course, when they heard, mathematicians heard this is an insolvable problem, they said, hold my beer, and they solved it. But what are the Hilbert questions of entrepreneurship? And this is something I, I found this story resonates with practitioners. What are the big questions that just trying to solve them would matter? And I would certainly love to have a long discussion of let's come up with the 20 Hilbert questions for entrepreneurship. I think that might be, might be, be pretty exciting. Uh, and I think, you know, to the, the short answer to Ivan's question is think of this in terms of, of the learning process at a deep level. What are we, what are we doing? What is not happening? What needs to happen? How can we make that different and do excellent work? So, so North, I'm going to jump in here, okay? okay? Because you raised something here. Let me let me ask you this question here. So, when I put this webinar together, right, my team said, "Oh, it's North." I'm like, "Yeah, we're going to do the usual. Please process it." They said, "Fine, we're going to do the web page, the badge, and the LinkedIn." And and then they said, "Should we do more promotion?" And I said, "No, no, North doesn't need promotion. He has a following, okay?" And, and some and, of them uh, are heavily armed, right? <laughs> And, and they say, really? I'm like, yeah, he, he has a brand. Norris has a brand. So let me, let me ask you this question here, and then we'll open up here. Imagine the future of education and research. You, you just mentioned earlier, why would a student in Boise, Idaho, take a class versus jumping online on a Zoom call and doing it with somewhere else? But let me, let me reframe this question for you here. And I guess even the people here that are on this, because now we're going to see basically the, 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 a lot of schools and universities and colleges are going to shut down with the new normal. They can't sustain the same business model as they did before. It's not going to happen. You know, students are not coming. Students are moving. Students are doing online. You know, international students are not coming in. So the whole industry is going to change. It's going to evolve. The this ones that are survive are going to get bigger and stronger. And the ones that were, you know, on the peripheral are going to shut down. Right, so we're going to see a recalibration of schools and universities, which mm -hmm. then takes us to faculty, takes us to educators. So let me propose this for you, okay? You like, you think of yourself as an athlete, 
or, 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 or a movie star or, or, or a celebrity, right? You are your own university. You are your own brand. So now let's say, and I think this is the future that's coming. They, so, you know, people in, for instance, UK, you, um, you know, Canada and saying, I want Norse. I want Norse to come right to my school and teach a course. And I want Norse to come to Paris to teach an executive course. I want Norse to sit with me and my top two young doctoral research centers or young uh, professors here and to work with them for two months on a journal submission. Okay. Hmm. So then what's going to happen and okay, then what happens in the past as a faculty member, you would say, this is collegiality. This is a faculty to faculty. So of course I'm going to do it. Just if you can play, please pay for my flight, maybe pay me a little bit for the class and maybe find me some lodging. I'll do it. That's how it used to be in the past because there was this collegial kind of ecosystem of sorts. You know, you do this, I do this. I invite you for this. I am, but let's, let's just put this on a side here. Let's reframe this. And, and this is what was a little bit done with, with Harvard business review, Harvard and all this stuff. You go get an agent. Okay. You get an agent. Heck, Christina can be your agent because she follows you everywhere. Okay. Right. You become an agent and then you say, you want Norris, Norris charges a thousand dollars an hour, right. To come and speak. Right? You want to work for Norris on the paper, that's a $20,000 initiative with Norris. You spend two months, you have to fly business, fly, business class ticket, um, you, um, you get a nice hotel or, 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 or apartment, right? You have your own expenses, right? Norris is a brand. Norris Kruger is a brand, okay? And you're exceptional. Your track record, your papers, everything will say to yourself, you know, you're going to get something good out of this. It's either ideas, it's either a paper, it's either a course, right? And then the next thing, you know, as I mentioned to my colleagues and my, and my, and my team here, don't worry, you'll have people register for it. We don't need to push that much to get people to register for them. And clearly it was exactly that what happened. As soon as we put it up, I, I looked at the numbers and the numbers shot right up. Why? Because they, as soon as they, you put it on your LinkedIn, as soon as you put it on your social media, people are like, oh, Norris is doing something. I need to join. I need to come. Is this the future? And why not? Why is it that we don't consider this to reward and encourage young researchers, established researchers, to take us to the next level? You know, and, 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 and again, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing the envelope here because this title is called In the Hot Seat here. It, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, um, I, it, I, I like, I love, certainly I would like your, your, your vision of, you know, I was trying to pick out my BMW while you were talking, but it's, uh, <laughs> no, I would never ride it. I'm not a BMW. I'm, I'd be, so hold on, so Norris, I like my, I like Norris, my bicycle. Let me, like let's my, test, but let me, let me, let's, let me test this. Let me test this. Okay. Let me, we have about what, 40 people here. Let me test this. How many people would, I'm just, let me test this. How many people would you would pay, would pay for a service such as this? Let's ask it, you know, and not them personally from their own pocket, their institution or their organization. How many would, you know, let, look, it's a phenomenon here. Let's ask, right? Well, I, the go. nice thing is that I mean that there could be economies of scope by involving more than one, uh, you know, if, you know, if you want to call it a star, but uh, that aggregating can be very, very valuable. Uh, that that it makes it uh, more and more. I mean, there's there are a lot of different wrinkles to this. That there will be. Put, you know, people say, well, my institution, I've already got an expert on X. Uh, we're not going to pay to bring someone outside in, even if they're much better, even if they have a brand. But in the long run, I think that's, that's the way it's going. Why but would Norris, I take... But they would, but they would, because remember, I just mentioned to you, universities are recreating themselves. Yeah. It becomes an issue as if we're, if we need to establish ourselves as a big name in this domain, we need to have Norris on our faculty and we can't tell him he's tenured or tenured because we can't afford it. Heck, we're letting people go, but we can say it's worth $20,000 yeah. for a semester. You know, and, you know and you can, some cute title visiting, visiting troublemaker or, you know, whatever it's, uh, but I think, 
you know, I just saw Lenny Buss's uh, question, you know, is that, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, I think a lot of the education, you know, she was asking about education is that it also, this, mo your model, I mean, also takes, it allows us to be more outside the, the, the university is if you're studying ecosystems, let's go sit at Techstars Boulder, uh, whatever it is uh, that, or whatever it is in their, their community. So the potentials, the, the possibilities of, of, for this model are immense. It's like, say, Nora, we love what you did. Who do you, you know, who do you know about, uh, you know, responsible entrepreneurship. And I'd say, I'm a, I know this guy named Iman in, in DC. You can't book him, he's too busy. But uh, if he can't do it, he would know. Is knowing who the very best, it's not just, I think for me, one of my strengths is I know who the very best people are in a lot of these fields. And I have to be careful because the ones who aren't may be, you know, I at risk of bending them. But uh, I look at it, this is, there are people on this call who are, you know, there are people I would learn from at the same time. I would learn from Lenny. I would learn from Nigel. I would learn from uh, from uh, uh, any number of these folks. So yes, but, but that, but I'm, but I'm ready. I you know I'm ready. Uh, Delta Delta Airlines keeps sending me emails now, like every day, saying, "Are you coming back?" <laughs> yeah, but 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 this is not new. Uh, North, you know, Harvard, Harvard commercialized this whole concept of finding, you know, finding the, the top star, right? And, and then, you know, disruptive innovation, Christensen and all that stuff. What they do is they find the top star, top researcher, and then they turn out the whole machine, right? Around this individual to make, to sell books, courses, seminars, speaking engagements, projects. Why is it then not all of us? Why is it then not everybody in that sense here? And, and, and think about it, it's more, but more than that here, there has to be what I call the human side, the humane side. So you say, I'm gonna take you know, 200 hours for my brand, but Norris with the 200 hours of my brand, I'm gonna take 50 hours of this and donate it to, to research, to working with young scholars from Africa, right? From Nigeria, from Kenya, Right from and I'll and I'll then have and listen to this. Then I'll have these young researchers following me. Right now, you next thing you know, you basically have this whole institution of networks all following you. You become the brand itself. It's 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 far fetched in a way this way. No, I, I don't think no, but I'm saying it is not far fetched because this is, you know, it, it works in the consulting world. It works in you know, is that people who have, <clears throat> you know, there's a whole area of economics, the economics of superstars is that communities do better if they have superstar businesses that, you know, the, you know, the best midfielder in professional soccer makes twice as much as the second best. And second best is pretty damn good. Uh, but I like what you're saying about young scholars. This is one thing that I've had I, I get some weird pushback from my fellow old parts, but I am astounded by the talent that in, among young scholars, the doctoral students, the, the junior faculty. You know, people, you know, you said Christina would be my agent. I think I could be her agent. Is she's someone who's doing great scholarly work, but she speaks entrepreneur. That she un, she she gets the the practice side, and you know they. There are so many talented. They're coming from places I've met. I've had conversations after these ICSB people hit me up on LinkedIn, and they're from Kazakhstan. Okay, Kazakhstan, and they have a lot to offer too. And just you know, being able to help them, you know, this young generation of talent, and some of them are older people who are really sort of retooling and coming into entrepreneurship. These are people we could help. You know, we could build a lot of great. We could build a great symphony, not just, you know, I might be a great soloist, but, you know, that building a great ensemble moves the entire field forward. And that, in a competitive sense, that's really, you know, that's really powerful. So, and, 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 and that's where I say, you know, you could say, oh, I am so-and-so from this university. And you can throw the university and saying, this is where my credentials come from, from this university. This is my reputation from this university or that university or that university. But let's just put the university silent now and say, I am Norris Kruger, <laughs> you know, 
that's a different conversation to have here, you know, and we can talk about all the, and these young researchers will support you more because they understand it's a win-win situation. Affiliated with you, yeah. it means more attention to them. And for you, the more they're affiliated with you, the more reputation you build. So this whole pro, this whole building up thing works well. That's how you do it. And then the next thing, you know, you create these networks of what we call superstars, right? And now you say, well, I know so-and-so, I know Nigel, and I know this, and I know, and everybody knows everybody type of thing. Is this the future? Because I mentioned- Oh, I, I think, I mean, it's Godfather a one, Godfather two now. Well, let's hope we can do better than Godfather three, but I've <laughs> been waiting for, to use that joke. Uh, but I think that in a lot of ways it's there. And I don't know, it's a, there's a group we sometimes, mostly Twitter, sometimes Facebook, of these incredible entrepreneurship educators and we share ideas and we yell at each other. And yeah, uh, so, and it said there are, these networks are already, social media has, has really facilitated that. I try to explain to a serious scholar that we just had a great entrepreneurship education conversation that went on for five days on Facebook because as the world turns, you know, somebody else wakes up and, and chimes in and on Facebook and Twitter, our friends see this and sometimes they chime in. I even had my brother chime in on Facebook going, you actually do know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, so let me, so there's a question. So I think where you're the trend, the trend lines are, are, are in that. So uh, let me, I, by the way, I want to invite that uh, Alexandra, if she's still on in Macedonia, that uh, she's pulling together at the end of the month uh, uh, a, a Zoom and R on, you know, how can we, you know, grow yep. oh, uh, Macedonia's on. You are all cordially welcome. So, so let me, so let me, let me ask you this question because it came from Lena here. She says, what about the students? What kind of future entrepreneurial students we want? So I'm going to answer this question, but I'm going to answer the question to you here. You just mentioned earlier, and this is what caught my attention. You said, why would a student in Idaho, Idaho Boise come and take a class? Well, they don't know you or they, know, they don't know that you're there. Okay. So they're thinking, oh, this school, I want to go to this school. This school has a big name, but let's say people know you because you're a brand now. So imagine this, you say, I'm going to put it, I'm going to, I'm going to have a class, picky, you know, I'm going to have a class in Paris. I'm going to, I'm not going to do it at the school. I'm going to do it at a top hotel. And the class is for seven days, right? And not only that, but I'm going to give access to University A, B, C, and D, and E in this area to send me five students each. So five times seven universities, that's 35 students in a class. But for them to come to take this class, they're going to take it with me in a top-notch hotel. It's going to be, it's going to be the best scholars, the best researchers coming in. And I'm going to call Lena, and I'm going to call Alexandra, and I'm going to call them all to them, hey, why don't you come and help me with a Zoom webinar or a meeting? And every student that comes in, you say to them, if you're coming in, if you are part of this executive program, this class is $10,000 a person. Why? Because you're going to get access to these top-notch researchers. So then the universities and the school is saying, I want to be part of this program. Why? Because I can then go find the best students that have the best availability, and I'm going to send them to this class. And I still want to say, and you say, and by the way, we're offering scholarships to X amount of students as well. So there's always this balance, right? So schools, instead of them competing against each other for limited resources and executive training and executive development saying, why don't we join forces, send five students each, 10 students each, and be part of this premier global network? Is this I, the future? I, I mean, this is the exec ed, executive ed model that's worked pretty well applied uh, to the scholarly setting. And I, it, it's, you know, it's exciting is that you're starting, I think you're starting to, to see some of that there, you know, there is a, Tom Lumpkin has his, you know, doctoral workshop on social entrepreneurship and, and there, we're seeing patterns of this, but it's very ad hoc uh, that it, that, you know, building a program, well, you, you're going to bring, you know, the best and brightest of, on multiple areas of entrepreneurship and it may be innovation, I think, uh, because at the same time, when you connect them, even if we're just connected on Zoom, that we're going to start seeing what the next generation of rock stars are, that, you know, and, you know, it, it's, 
the opportunities to to collaborate it's right now we do you get lucky like at uh you know the ipeg uh, conference in 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 paris there were people there you know with i'd never heard of and they go and i'm gonna make embarrass alexandra again is she's like oh i have this paper and i don't know you know and i, I think it's i kind of like it and it was bloody bloody good and now it's published in jsbm and it's getting cited uh i mean finding ways to and all of that builds and enriches the the network for some people you know it's not going to be publication it's going to be impact in their in their community that uh there are still a lot of schools that i their entrepreneurship program it's uh you know that it's it's all about the money that it's not at all about you know engaging with you know all of your stakeholders that to lend to lemmy's question that is how do we you know there there are it's a different style of education it's that that is alien to you know i you know that it's not pedagogy it's andragogy it's maybe even pedagogy uh that sorry yeah. for the big words but how do you move from how you teach kids to how do you teach adults to how do you teach people to be uh, uh to be self-directed learners is it engaging immersing and, and the thing i found uh, oecd showcase of these top uh primary and secondary schools 26 of them, every single one of them, they were co-immersed with their community. The, the students were engaged in the community, but the community was engaged with them and, and reaching out to all of the important stakeholder groups. Uh, when I was at Boise State, we actually engaged for a while with the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, that it was a world that was alien to most of our students, even though they were right down the street and opening their eyes to the possibilities and now they're interested because the hispanic community is doing there <clears throat> our hispanic entrepreneurial community is actually doing probably better than ever been anyone uh that the students aren't aware of that is this is getting at once the it's it is all about empathy and understanding that what's common and what and what's different and <clears throat> thinking of it yeah. is, is, is i think that there i think is that the nice thing is these are the kinds of insights that you don't normally get in an, <clears throat> a traditional, you know, here's a, here's a famous scholar, have him talk for an hour kind of seminar. But what you're talking about is this deeper engagement. It's, it's truly, it's true mentoring. It's, uh, and, and it's truly collaborative. And if you do that, it will be incredibly powerful because anyone can round up a bunch of experts. But how figuring out how to you know to get to build that deep engagement with uh, with the attendees, uh, it'll make it worth the price. And that's hell, why hell I'd want to hell I'd want to take it. So that's why I, I called you the Nicholas Tesla here because you can see it evolving very fast, and we're we're entering a new world here. And look, we have Tomala from Nigeria, and we have all these people coming here, right? It's not just about putting students in seats and saying, or put, putting people just write an article because you're going to get published and then you're going to get tenure. We're lucky if this model continues with tenure, with with universities offering this stuff. The world is changing in that sense. You know, it, it is. And and I mean, I think about, you know, I tell people, well, why are you talking to someone in Indonesia? And I say, or Pakistan. It's like Google how many people live there. <laughs> live there. Yeah. Same with uh, Tomala. How many people live in Nigeria? It's 100 million, 150 million. It's a, it's 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 going to be the third largest population in the world in in 15 years. I mean, um, so so, but I, I, we need to end this. But we we need to continue this conversation here. So let's do this again soon. And and I, I would ask the people who are on this call to, you know, you think about what should we talk about next? How do we move Ayman's this? You know, I'm speaking a little selfishly here. But, well, it's, but but I, I, how do we I, move Ayman's idea forward? And uh, any of well, you call me, email me. No, no, uh, no, no, Norris. You have an agent now, okay? So you're not taking calls. We're negotiating on your behalf here. So we'll we'll figure out who's your agent here. Christina, maybe we'll become your agent, and I will <laughs> I will work with Christina, and then we'll book. We'll we'll um, we'll. I see Christina's laughing, right? And and but you're you're definitely coming to Paris for 2021 here, and let let us try this. You know why I'm, not? 
You know, if it's, I, if it's at Station F, I'll definitely be, be there. Well, then why don't we say this? Next year, 2021, Norris is going to be not just coming to the conference, but he's going to be offering a class. It will be the first class, you know, offered at ICSB in a conference setting. So not you just come to the conference to publish. You actually sit in a class and we'll, we'll do a class. As and I'll, we, I have my mask and just in case. Well, I think by then we'll hopefully we'll be good. But let us let us stop here. I want to I want to thank you here. This is just I told you this is this is the conversation I wanted to have here. And 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 so you you just been absolutely fantastic. And on behalf of everybody here, I want to uh, thank you all for attending and uh, for joining here. And and then and then and then we'll go from there. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks again. Bye. Yeah. <sighs>